Welcome to this special episode of The Dark Parade. My name is Bo, and I am a found footage fool. Tell me the camera thing isn't annoying. Yeah, it's annoying. Hey everyone, welcome back. Uh, I figured what we would do, uh, as I, uh, regular listeners will know, um, I am constantly in a fight for time, and uh, what with uh, all of the school stuff, and I'm getting there, I'm getting there, things are, are starting to look up, but uh, in the meantime, um, I, I have to do some episodes that maybe aren't like full guests and full interviews and 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 deep dives on movies and stuff like that. We will get there. But for now, it is our uh, our responsibility, our duty, nay, our calling to look at a handful of found footage movies. And <laughs> I started with a theme which was completely derailed by the fact that The Outwaters was released, a, a movie that has been getting a little bit of buzz. So this is a weird mishmash episode where two of the movies, which were originally going to comprise this episode, um, were, you know, themed around the idea of, like, horny <laughs> found footage movies. Found footage movies that are a little sexed up. And then, you know, the Outwaters dropped, and it was like, okay, well, let's fit that in. We're not going to make it a separate episode. So this is going to be, you know, three movies in one on this episode. And the first movie we're going to talk about is a movie called Sex Tape. S-X underscore tape is the name of this movie. It came out in 2013. Uh, the the uh, the stats on uh, Sex Tape are... Uh, it was uh, directed by uh, Bernard Rose, who is the guy who did Candyman. And it, it was produced by a couple of the guys who uh, produced some of the... Uh, paranormal activity movies and that's how it bills itself that <laughs> hey the, you know this is the director of Candyman and the the producers of uh of, of paranormal activity so you know you're in for a good time but it's mm. all right anyway so the premise of sex tape is that you have um a, a dude named ian he is a filmmaker he's got a girlfriend slash you know, his muse, his, uh, the diva that he is with named Jill, um, who is an artist and they are, uh, they're, you know, in a very sexual relationship and I'm already making this sound a million times better than what the movie is, but they're in a, a very sexual relationship. And so he takes her to this like haunted asylum kind of thing, an old abandoned hospital and is like, Hey, let's, you know, I thought you could use this for your next art installation. And also, while we're here, how about we do some some fucking? And so that's what happens. And then she gets kind of possessed by uh, the ghost of a woman who was in this hospital. And then it turned out that they were abused by the doctors there. And, you know, spoilers for sex tape, a movie that, you know... I'm going to tell you, you probably should not watch. Um, and yeah. And, and so she ends up just going on a murder spree and you know, the, like the movie kind of starts with her, um, you know, in a, uh, a police interrogation room saying, you know, what happened to Ian? Where's my boyfriend? And they're like, um, well, you don't know. Cause you were kind of the murderer. And, and, you know, it's that trope, right? Like, we've seen this before. Um, and that is... Uh, well, let's get into it, right? We've got five uh, criteria that we use to evaluate these kinds of movies, the, these found footage movies. And uh, let's get right to it in regards to uh, six tape. Um, the, the first is keeping the camera on, which is fine. Like, the whole movie is uh, about a guy who is a filmmaker... And some of it is there's a little bit of security camera footage. Um, although I think he's filming the security cameras and also why are the security cameras? Uh, they turn on the power at one point if memory serves. 
um, where they're like, oh my God, all the power works here. And that's why we have all this security camera uh, stuff that we can look at. Um, so it, it makes enough sense. Like that is not a sticking point for six tape that, uh, the camera is, is not inordinately kept on. Although, you know, as with a lot of these movies, when you get to the end and murder is happening, you're like, put down the camera and run, dude, what are you doing? So there's a little bit of that, but for the most part, it's kind of fine. Again, you know, like did Blair Witch do it best? Maybe so. You know, I, I think about this, like what movie does it best? I like those in the computer stuff, like, um, uh, you know, missing and, and follow following missing, uh, you know, uh, unfriended. Um, and the one that I can never remember the name of, but, uh, about the guy that was the game streamer and the, the haunted game where members of his, uh, viewing audience were getting murdered. I like that one pretty good. And, uh, yeah, so I, I like that kind of stuff. Uh, and I think maybe that's my favorite, you know, host is a good example of like, okay, well, obviously this is, uh, there's a good reason for all of this to be recorded. Um, and, you know, this is fine, but not perfect. Uh, then we get to characters. And, uh, you, like, there are some reviews that really call out the lead actress uh, who plays uh, Jill in the movie. And her name is, is Caitlin Folly. And she's been in, in, you know, a handful of movies, uh, this, a movie called Restraint, a movie called Speak, a movie called Happy Endings, um, you know, kind of lower budget stuff. And the thing I will say is I think her performance is pretty good, you know, and it calls for her to, you know, do some naked stuff and, and be, um, very sexual and very, be very free. And a lot of, I've seen some people kind of ding this performance from her or the character itself as being kind of irritating. And I don't know if I totally disagree with that. I, you know, I think that's a little more subjective and obviously we're doing pure science here with our five criteria. What I will say is I have known people like this. Um, you know, the, the kind of artsy bohemian, you know, free love kind of vibe. And I think that it's a pretty good encapsulation in this movie of that sort of that 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 sort of person, um, you know that 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 kind of person that uses their sexuality um, as, as a bit of a tool, but it's also just part of who they are, you know. They, like they are like sex is a big part of their lives and the expression of that and that kind of thing, and. Um, so I think that's okay. I think Ian, and then they've got a couple of other friends that show up at a, a, a certain point and you're like, well, these people are terrible. So, you know, I think Jill is kind of interesting or that, that character trope is kind of interesting. Um, but then it falls off for me. The rest of the characters I think are, are, you know, tolerable to awful. And so, you know, it, 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 that's a real mixed bag. I don't, I don't know that I would recommend this movie on the basis of its characters, which brings us to criteria number three, which is authenticity. Does this movie feel real, uh, within the confines of the movie? And, uh, and, and that's a, a big problem is that when you actually do see the ghost, the ghost is not like, it's just a person, you know, they they do kind of a, a shimmery, effect and a little bit of a uh, time stop of effect with the movement and that kind of thing. Nothing you haven't seen in like J horror movies and, and that sort of thing. And it's just not very good. And so when, when it gets to the supernatural stuff and there's not that much of it in this movie, quite frankly, like once you have Jill possessed, there's not a whole lot of English that they put on this ball. It is, she is now possessed and, and, and has like these weird uh, lapses, these fugue states where she sort of becomes this other person. But that's all done through performance. It's not really done through um, any sort of effects. And, you know, and again, I would say Caitlin Foley does a pretty good job in those moments, but it's just not very convincing. Uh, not because of, of her performance, but just it, it feels chintzy. 
right? Like, that's the big thing is, it, yes, I know this movie was probably made on the cheap, but it feels that. And we'll get to another movie here in a minute that was made on the cheap that feels bigger and grander. And this movie feels incredibly small. For it being the guy who directed Candyman, and then, again, a lot of years between Candyman and this, um, and Fortune's Rise and Fall and all that, but it just feels, you know, kind of dull and small and, and uninteresting, which it gets to our, our fourth criteria, which is watchability. Like, how watchable is this movie? And that's the big problem, is the movie's just dull as dirt. <laughs> and, and when something supernatural does happen... It, it like the stuff that happens in this movie is stuff that if you've ever watched any of these movies, uh, these found footage movies like like I've uh, like and I, I tend to watch more than I should, but it's just trope after trope after trope in this movie where you're like, oh, we're going to the abandoned hospital. Oh, okay, she's gonna get possessed by something that's there. Oh, then she's gonna take out the revenge, uh, you know, for the the what happened to this ghost, and it's just boring it's predictable aside from you know the jill character and caitlin folly's performance which is is interesting if not genuinely good um that's it that's the only thing to recommend this and it's just not enough to get you through this 90 minute movie and that's one of the big problems with a lot of these found footage films is that there's a lack of ambition and this feels incredibly unambitious you know this feels very by the numbers it feels very rote and when you add in the fact that it's not scary um which is our fifth criteria right is it scary a hundred percent not there's nothing scary about this movie um other than you know maybe you should choose your friends better that's maybe a small moral of the of the film but yeah it just it doesn't do anything that makes you want to continue watching it and i made it through the whole thing uh because that's what i do that's my my curse my burden is that i can't turn off a movie to save my life but six tape is just not worth your time it's it's not scary it's not interesting um the the one element that is good about it is you know, just a, sort of a character exploration of, hey, you may remember someone like this in your past. And that was the only thing that pulled me through the movie was like, oh, this kind of reminds me of this girl I knew in high school and, and actually dated for a little bit. And that's kind of interesting to me. Um, but that's it. That's it. That's the only thing to recommend this movie. So stop it. Six tape. Don't do any more of these. I, w I do not want a six tape two. Um, okay. Okay. So that's uh, six tape out of the way. Um, don't watch that one. Then we've got movie number two, which is a um, a Brazilian movie called uh, either Baby Nymph is the uh, the American uh, title. The um, original title is hashtag Ninfa Baby, and this is a more interesting film. So the premise of this is that you've got uh, a girl named uh, Sibel, um, and she is a not an influencer. She's kind of one of those girls that goes online and lip syncs in sexy outfits and does her makeup and stuff like that. Now, you know, influencer I think is overstating it. I think it's more. It, it's like a step away from an OnlyFans, but you see them on Twitch and YouTube and that kind of thing. Like women who are very attractive, and that is kind of their shtick, you know, is they cultivate their audience by doing, you know, sexy stuff. They lay in bed in skimpy outfits and talk to the chat and, you know, do their makeup in a mirror or they do their lip syncing routine and do sexy dances along with it, that kind of stuff. So that's her deal. And she is inviting her friend Diane over for a weekend. And, you know, she kind of says like, hey, you know, th my friend is really innocent and I am going to uh, have her, 
like follow in my footsteps. She is going to be sort of my protege. And there's also a stepmother in the mix that the main character, Sabelle, is sort of friends with. But, like, the stepmother broke up with the father. And there's this weird dynamic between the two of them where they're kind of friends but not really. And uh, Dee Dee is the name of the the uh, former lover of, of Sabelle's father. And... You know, there's an antagonism there, and then at a certain point, they're calling up a drug dealer named Dion, uh, Dionysus to come over. And you may notice that a lot of these names are Greek inspired. Like um, uh, Sibel uh, talks about how she is um, uh, fancies herself uh, kind of like Io the nymph uh, from Greek mythology, and then you've got a Diana and a Dionysus and. Um, you know, it, it. She lives on like Narcissus Lane, that kind of thing. That feels like it's trying to be clever, but I don't know that it totally adds up entirely. Um, you know, into something like a, a, based on some cursory research of well, you know, did these mythological characters affect one another? And kind of not really. So it's a, it's a little. It feels a little piecemeal in that respect. But, um, anyway, so that's kind of the story. Like, one thing leads to another, and there's a home invasion, and there's murder and mayhem at the end of the movie. Much of the movie, though, is just Diane and Sibel, you know, drinking and playing Truth or Dare and lip-syncing. And, you know, it's a long tail on that kite before you get to the stuff that if you're a horror movie found footage fan that you get to the stuff that is the horror movie found footage footage part of this and that's uh perhaps a, a knock against it and then when you get to the mayhem part of it it's like okay well you know i don't know that you couldn't have seen this coming but um but let's get to the the criteria shall we um and the first is keeping the camera on is there a good reason to keep the camera on of course there is because this is all about a girl who is obsessed with recording her life and herself and her relationship with um, the fans, although that is a little thin in terms of her motivation, I, I feel like that's kind of a missed opportunity. Um, I, you know, there was that movie. Uh, I think well, was it was uh, it wasn't called Drive. It was the Uber movie with the kid from Stranger Things, where he's trying to cultivate an audience. Um, and I, I can't recall the name of it now, but that one I think is far superior to this. And it, they're both kind of doing the same things and that's a much better movie. Um, baby nymph is, you know, more, more about the, the sexuality part of it and being the sort of this alluring siren to an audience, but without as much direct interaction with that audience, uh, as you see in, uh, some other movies of this type that tackle social media and that kind of thing. Um, I followed, I think is the name of the movie where about the guy who goes into the haunted hotel and does a show there. Again, a much better movie, a movie that has some actual genuinely creepy moments in it. And I think that's, you know, uh, what this movie is kind of getting at, but it never quite gets there. But, uh, you know, as far as the criteria of keeping the camera on, that's totally uh, fine. That Like, that is uh, entirely believable. And even when you get to the end, when the camera is being dropped and you're seeing things from a fixed perspective and uh, sort of the last moments of the movie are, you know, Nympha Baby uh, trying to find the camera. And that stuff works. So you have that. Then you have... Um, characters uh, and how are the characters in this movie and and that's pretty good um, you know there's definitely distinct characters like uh, Sabelle and uh, her friend Diane are very distinct personalities but you can also see why they're friends and like where Sabelle is dressed provocatively and, and seems more adult um, Diane is much more you know Virginal is perhaps not the best way to put it, but more innocent, 
Um, she has braces, so it makes her look younger naturally. And um, so, yeah, it, you know, I think the characters work for the most part. The, the other characters that surround it, like the father and and Dee Dee, the you know ex, the father's ex, and uh, Dionysus, all of those characters are super thin. You know, they're very much uh, characters in service of the plot. And so the two main characters are what we're concentrating on. And, and that's fine. Uh, you know, I think there is something interesting and maybe it's just because I'm inherently interested in the idea that there is something interesting about somebody who lives in the public eye. And that's sort of their personality, um, is recording everything being the, this public persona. And again, you see it, it's something that is not unfamiliar. And, you know, this movie, uh, came out in 2016, so maybe even a little bit ahead of the curve as far as the the sort of thing like the, the amaranths of the world and pokey babes and whatnot, uh, Pokimane. Um, so yeah, it, I, I feel like it's going for that kind of thing. Although we still haven't seen a good movie built around um, that kind of Twitch streamer. You know, not the gamer, but the one that's doing like, hey, I'm just going to show you my life. and But I'm going to do it because, wink, wink, I'm going to be wearing sexy stuff and writing people's names on my body uh, who are subscribing and that kind of thing. Like, I feel like there was a movie to be made of that. And I don't have the, the best idea for it yet. But I And if there was one out there, please drop me a line uh, on Discord and let me know because I feel like there is a... A, a fertile field of, of scares there somehow. And I'm just not sure quite how to get to them. Um, but yeah, characters, uh, much like six tape, there are a couple that are interesting and the rest are, you know, pretty disposable in terms of actually being characters. Um, then you get to authenticity. And I think that feels pretty good. Like the, the, her behavior and the stuff that she's recording and how she talks on camera and the way that she's trying to get her friend to sort of buy into her lifestyle. And when she doesn't quite, um, she does a real heel turn and gets real catty about it. Like all of that feels genuine. That feels like a thing that could happen within the world of the film. Now, by the end of the movie, when it gets into this home invasion piece of it, which is only the last like 15, 20 minutes, that feels a, almost a bridge too far because everything else was so grounded and this feels a little extreme. Um, but, it, you know, like it strains credulity, but I don't know that it breaks it. Uh, but it it does get to a point where you're like, I don't know about this. Um, and and that takes us to the, the watchability piece of this. And is the movie watchable? Sure. Sure. It is, you know that's probably where I land with the movie ultimately is like, eh, if you, if you like found footage and you're looking for something that is attacking this kind of subject matter, then maybe you'll enjoy this. Um, I, I don't think it's very good. I think I gave it a two, two and a half star somewhere in that neighborhood. And, and that feels right to me. It is mediocre. Um, you know, it's got as many flaws as it does uh, points in its favor, it does feel reasonably authentic and and thus the watchability or fourth criteria, the watchability factor. You know, it's most like I wasn't totally bored and I found some of the shenanigans of the main character to be interesting just because I like a movie that's trying to say something social, you know, that there is a message in the movie. Um, but it doesn't quite stick the landing. So the watchability is like, it, it's a real creaky hand, like close but no cigar kind of thing. Um, I don't know that I was outright bored by it, but it takes a while to get to the end. And once you get to the end, it's a little bit too arch. Um, and then that goes, the, the, the final criteria here is, is scares. Uh, is the movie scary? Um, no, it is not a scary movie. At best, it's sort of interesting. Um, when you get to the end of the movie and, and sort of see the the turn that, you know, Ninfa Baby makes, you're like, ah, okay. I mean, I feel like I've, we saw this coming, but I get it. I get it. You're making a statement. It's fine. 
Um, so yeah, I is the movie a good movie? Mm, not really. Is it kind of weirdly up my alley in terms of dealing with a, a social phenomenon that I feel like there is good found footage to be made of? Absolutely. This is not quite what I want, but it's a stab at it. And, you know, I mean, all the, the performers are game and they're going for it. And uh, Dandara Adrian, I think, is the name of the uh, the young lady who plays Sabelle. And she's quite good in it. Um, you know, really is going for it. And is kind of a shitty character, but that's the character, right? And so that's kind of fun. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, it, <laughs> is it better than Six Tape? Yes. Is it something I would recommend? Eh. You know, again, with all the caveats of you you would have to be interested in this kind of thing like I am, uh, this kind of subject matter, to get much out of it. And even then, it's only so successful. So let your conscience be your guide on this one. I don't I don't I I would not recommend it to the random viewer. Okay, so let's get to the uh, the real star of the show, which is a movie called The Outwaters. And The Outwaters, uh, I had heard a little bit about, and I think some people were talking about it on Discord and saying like, hey, you're going to check this out or uh, you should check this out. And I was always going to. like, it, It's found footage. There had been some talk about it in the... Um, you know, kind of horror movie circles. And so I was, you know, I was into it. I wanted to, to see what the movie was about. And it's kind of interesting to have watched this and Skin a Marink within a month of one another. Because I think this movie is of a type with Skin a Marink. Like it, it is kind of experimental um, in its way. But okay, so the, the premise is. That you've got um, a, a young lady who is going to record a music video out in the desert. And it's her, it's one of her musician pals, uh, the cinematographer, and another girl along um, who's going to do like hair and makeup and that kind of thing. And the way that I watched this movie... Uh, before I get to that, let me finish the synopsis. So this, uh, the end of the synopsis is they go out into the middle of the desert. They start hearing strange things. And then um, something happens one night. And then you're kind of the, the back end of the movie, a full half of the movie really, is trying to figure out like what in the hell happened? Is it repeating? Is there some sort of time element involved with this? Um, that kind of thing. So it's it's... Like I said, it's borderline experimental. And, you know, it's about an hour 40, hour 50 long. So it's the longest of the movies that we're going to talk about as well. And I, the way I would describe it to people is if Benson and Moorhead did a found footage movie and they, instead of directing it, they hired the guy who did Skin and Marink. And it feels very surreal. And this was done on a super low budget. And and so the previous movies that we talked about, whether it's it's Baby Nymph or Six Tape, both of those felt very contained, very claustrophobic in a lot of ways. The Outwaters is filmed out in the middle of the desert, and as such, it feels grander and and more expansive, and it feels more expensive, even though I don't think it was very expensive and uh so it's it's interesting what you can do with no money if you just pick the right setting so um it it opens with this like 911 call that's really really effective as far as like setting like the what in the hell is going to go on in this movie and and then kind of from there your mileage may vary but uh, there's a, a fair amount of time setting up the characters, uh, and then you get to the weirdness of the movie, like I said, about halfway through, maybe even a little more than halfway through. And then from there on, it's just like, what the fuckery left and right. So let's get to the keeping the camera on. Um, is that legit? Uh, yes. 
because the character Robbie, who is also the writer and director of this movie, um, he is like using the camera partially for light, partially because he's a cinematographer. That's what he does, and he's trying to to piece together what's happened here. And so I think that's fine. Um, then we come to characters, and that's one of the thing about things about the Outwaters I really like is that all the characters are believable they're kind of interesting they're they're two-dimensional um or three-dimensional rather not just two-dimensional um like the the character of uh oh what it was her name michelle yeah michelle who is the singer in this and she's you know got this very hippy dippy like uh the other character Ange was was trying to describe her wardrobe and describe it as like coachella and that's kind of her, you know, she's like, it's the flowing dresses and, and she's got the tats and, you know, likes to wear flowers in her hair and stuff like that. And it, like, she has this relationship with her mother who passed away and is recording a song that is a lullaby that uh, her mother sang to her and she's very quick to get emotional and like it's a person that if you went to college you know this person um similarly like robbie and and scott um are brothers and you know one has a good relationship with the mother one does not um there's some question about what happened to their father and you know they have these very different personalities and then there's Ange, who is the hair and makeup girl that's coming along, and she's a little more, you know, like, this is a shot for her to do, like, Hollywood makeup, even though they're, it, you know, doing this on the cheap, going out and filming this video and using the desert for production value, just like the movie is. You know, it's a, a little bit meta in that way. But, like, all the characters are kind of interesting, and I enjoyed listening to them talk to one another. They weren't just irritating teenagers you know like they they had a purpose for going out there they're you know creative to one degree or another they have their own lives and their own desires and you know it, it felt like watching a real movie which is not always the case with some of this found footage stuff um then you get to authenticity is the movie authentic does it uh, within the context of the film do the events feel like they could happen and that is also a tough thing to answer because I don't, because of the events of the movie and because the movie is so deliberately obtuse that you don't exactly know everything that happens. Much like Skinamarink. It's more, do you get this vibe? Do you understand uh, that this is all kind of a surreal experience that they're have having maybe there's some creature at the center of it maybe it is just somebody who went bananas maybe there's a, like a sci-fi element to it um it, i don't know like you're you could tell me an interpretation of this movie that would be very different from mine and we would probably both be right so it's tough to gauge authenticity when there's so much that could be happening that's never directly pointed at. And that is both the problem and the great thing about this movie. But as far as authenticity goes, I, it's it's hard to say. I mean, I would give it a passing grade uh, on, on a scale of authenticity. Um, is it watchable? Okay, so fourth criteria, is this watchable? Yes, very much so. I was engaged. I wanted to know what was going to happen next. I don't know that I was ultimately satisfied with that answer. And that's probably my biggest knock against the Outwaters is I don't need everything spelled out for me. But if you watch the Benson and Moorhead movies, which this feels akin to or adjacent to, then there is, if not a whole answer, like something like Resolution, where you know, there is not a spoon fed answer to what is happening, but there's enough to get your fingers in that you're like, Oh, okay. I see. I, I kind of half understand what's happening. And I don't feel that way with the outwaters. I feel like there are three or four different ways you can view this movie. And all of them have a little bit of evidence within the text of the film, but I don't know that any of them are satisfying. 
Um, I, I just want to feel like I'm part of the movie experience and not like I'm just not shown a thing. It's like, well, figure it out. And this feels like that ultimately. Um, but I enjoyed my time with it and, and the way I watched it, which I, I mentioned earlier and then, you know, interrupted myself cause I, I wanted to talk about it here. So I watched this on the computer on Screenbox, which I now have a six month subscription to cause it's only like $5. Well, in fairness, $15 to subscribe for six months, which also means I'm probably going to get around watching that terrifier too before long. Um, <laughs> anyway, it's available on Screenbox, and I watched it there, lights out, headphones on, and much like Skin of Marine, I would kind of recommend that the sound design in this movie is really exceptional, and that went a long way towards the watchability, so make sure you are listening to this uh, movie with good sound, because it, it will make a difference. Um, this movie was done... like. The visuals, especially towards the back end of this movie, are very, very limited. A lot of times you're just limited to this small, like, flashlight cone of light, and that's all you see. And that is, at times, frustrating. At times it really pays off. Um, but, so, you know, just be <laughs> be warned when you get into the outwater, outwaters, this is not just some, like, creature feature out in the desert kind of thing. This is very much a heady, you know, filmmaker, surreal journey kind of movie. And and that brings us to scares. Is the movie scary? Um, yeah, at times. At times, it, it sure is. I found the best parts of the movie are when all the characters are just hearing this strange stuff and are trying to figure out what it is. and And seeing some things where you think like, oh, I don't... I don't know that that is right. You know, like this silhouette of a guy holding an axe off in the distance that keeps recurring through the movie. Um, you know, th there are moments, especially in the middle of the movie, when things first take a turn to the weird. I think that stuff is genuinely good and unsettling and eerie. By the time you get to the end of the movie, I don't know that it pays off you know or continues to be a scary because the more the more the movie is kind of adding to this you know tower of lore that it seems to be creating of here's what's really happening but we're not going to give you a good look at it and we're not going to explain any of this we're just going to let you kind of interpret um uh, you know look i am all for lynchian Attacks on the subconscious. I think that's what Skin and is. And Skin and is a movie I, I tend to think a lot about. Um, I, I think the more I think about it, the more I'm like, I'm, I need to go back and watch this again. The Outwaters, I don't know that I want to go back and, and revisit this because as little as I understand about it, I don't know that I feel compelled to change my understanding of it. Uh, I think it's interesting. I think it's pretty good. I think it's worth a watch, especially if you're looking for a found footage movie that's done well. Like the, It's well-directed, and the sound design is fantastic, and the characters are more interesting than almost anything you see in this style of movie. Um, I landed on about three stars for the movie total because I don't think it gels completely, but I do think it's worth your time. If you like found footage movies, and I assume that you do at least to some extent if you're listening to this, you should watch it. And I don't... You you might have a reaction one way or the other. Like, I kind of landed in the middle where I was like, I think it's good, but it's flawed. And there are things about it that I would like to see sharpened so that it invites you into the movie a little more instead of pushing you away. Um, but I could see people like, this is all nonsense artsy fartsy trash i can see that and i can see people really loving it like it's, it's a divisive movie and when you look at you know as as i look at the letterbox scores it runs the gamut like the four and a half and five is probably the thinnest but it like it is an incredibly divisive movie so um yeah yeah i <laughs> There are things I liked about it, and, and it was interesting. I'm glad a movie like The Outwaters exists. I'm glad people are still trying to push 
found footage in two new directions. And this movie certainly feels like it's trying to do that. Um, okay. So enough uh, found footage nonsense. We will be back in a week. Uh, next week should be a What You Watching with uh, our old pal Jamie. And we will talk about uh, perhaps this movie again and others. Uh, we shall see. Um, but as always, you know, thanks for, for sticking around while... Uh, I've been going to school and then I got my teaching job and now I've got my teaching job and that takes a lot of time um, because I'm still getting my my hands around it and trying to figure out how to do it well and manage 130 odd kids and uh, you know (laughs) plus dealing with kids at home and man oh man I so love the moments when like last night where I was like I'm going to the office I'm watching this found footage movie i will see you all in two hours uh and and that's really satisfying uh to be able to steal away like that for at least a little bit so thanks for joining me uh in my you know attempts to completely shirk responsibility and duty um so that i can talk about found footage movies and uh so again we'll be back in a week with uh jamie sammons and and thank you as always uh for joining the dark parade We'll see you next time.